Well, in the fourth century, there was a young man. His mother was a devout believer. He was from North Africa. But rather than listening to the instruction of his mother, he decided to go and taste all that the world had to offer. He indulged in, in sinful activities and a sinful lifestyle and every kind of sin you can imagine. He tried every different philosophy, trying to figure out what is life about? How are we to live? And he tried these different cult groups, trying to figure out how am I to live? And at age 31, having tried every conceivable philosophy and false religion, having indulged in a sinful lifestyle, this young man found himself completely empty. And he was in a playground. And he was there in this playground with children that he heard a child's voice on the swing and he heard these words, take up and read, take up and read, take up and read. So this young man took up the Bible and he began to, to read the Bible and he began to live out Scripture and he came to faith in Jesus Christ. And this young man would write some of the early church writings that have impacted the church for, uh, for generations, for centuries. He's known by the name St. Augustine. And a thousand years later, during what's known as the Protestant Reformation, where they returned to the Word of God. And they said, we are a people of the book. We believe that we're saved by grace through faith. We believe that the Bible is sufficient and it points us to Jesus Christ. Those reformers also went back to the teachings of St. Augustine. You see, the church, our enemy always wants to pull us away from the Word of God. He wants us to believe the lie that we can find joy and meaning and purpose outside of God Himself, outside the truth of living by His Word. And today, we're in a unique passage in Scripture. We're in a, we're in a passage of Scripture that probably most people would not choose to preach on. It's just where we happen to be but it's actually a very important passage of Scripture. You see, back in May, God led us to preach through the book of Nehemiah. And I say God led us to because we've had several, if you've been here with us, you know we have several projects going on at this church. We're building a retaining wall, repairing a retaining wall, repairing a building, building a youth center, doing some updates in our worship center. So we have a lot of things going on. So when we're building a wall, we thought, well, if God's given us a book in the Bible about a wall, we should probably preach through it. So during the month of May and June, we preached the first half of Nehemiah. And let me tell you, the first half of Nehemiah is super exciting. It's Nehemiah, God places a burden on his heart. Jerusalem's in shambles. They need a wall. He begins to pray, God, let me go build a wall. He plans, and then he takes action. And in one of the beautiful miracles of the Old Testament, he builds a wall of Jerusalem with the help of all the people of Jerusalem in 52 days. Now, most people who read the book of Nehemiah, most people who preach through it or study it, focus on the first half of the book. Focus on the, the portion where he's building a wall. But actually, I don't think that's the most important part of Nehemiah. I think the most important part comes after the wall is finished. They've completed this huge physical project, and now what are they going to do? How are they going to rebuild the people? And that's what we've been looking at the last few weeks. We've started in a section. After they build the wall, Nehemiah calls for Ezra the priest. Come teach the people the word of God. And last week, in Nehemiah chapter 8, we saw four things. I gave you four things last week. If you were here with us, if not, I'll uh, give them to you again. The people gathered to worship, and here's how they came to worship. They gathered expectantly. They came 
gathering to expecting to hear from God. Secondly, they listened attentively. I've sat through many church services. Not only do I, am I a pastor, but I've also attended church my whole life and heard church services. And I know the struggle and the temptation as you sit here to go, now where are we going to go eat lunch after this? You know, What all do I have to do this week to not really listen attentively? The enemy wants to distract us. Thirdly, they responded properly to the word of God. And fourthly, they departed joyfully. Last week we saw a beautiful picture of how we're to gather as the body of Christ, as the people of God. Well, this week we're going to continue on in that same thought. We're going to see more about how are we as a people, as a community, as a collective to approach the Word of God, both as a church and as individuals. Let me tell you where we are in Israel's history. It's a dark day. Persia, a foreign nation, is ruling over them. They've just built the walls of Jerusalem, and they're gathering to worship God and to celebrate the holy days. We often call those holidays. The holy days they gather. And the Jewish holy day, the first holy day of the year, the civil, is the civil new year called Rosh Hashanah. They would blow the trumpet and celebrate. Ten days later was the most sad mournful, sorrowful, holy day of the year. It's called the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, where the people would remember, we are sinful. And the high priest would go in and perform these rituals, picturing Christ who would come and ultimately bring forgiveness, but so that God's people could be forgiven for another year. The priest would come and do these rituals, and it was called, it's called in Hebrew, Yom Kippur. But after Yom Kippur came this unique holiday called the Feast of Tabernacle. It lasted seven days. And that's what we're going to see today is they're celebrating the Feast of Tabernacle, also called the Feast of Booths. So that's where we are. Uh, we're going to be looking in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 13 through 18. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, the words will be on the screen. But let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Nehemiah chapter 8, starting in verse 13. On the second day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people, with the priests and the Levites, came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim it and publish it in all their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths, as is written. So the people went out. And they brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square of the water gate and in the square of the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly of those who had returned from captivity made booths and lived in booths. For from the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, to, the day of the, to that day, the people of Israel had not done so. And there was very great rejoicing and day by day from the first day to the last he read the book of the law of God and they kept the feast seven days and on the eighth day there was a solemn assembly according to the rule this is the word of God for the people of God and all God's people said praise be to God you may be seated God we thank you for your word your word that declares that all men are like grass and all our glories like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but your word, O oh Lord, stands forever. We ask that this be the word that's faithfully preached today. Unless you speak, nothing of any eternal significance will be spoken here today. So speak, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. So today we're going to see how these people that are gathered 
to hear the Word of God, how they respond to the Word of God. And we're going to see three things. I'm going to give these to you at the front, we're going to walk through each of these. We're going to see exposition. Exposition of the Word of God. We're going to see application and celebration. Exposition, application, and celebration. How we as a collective approach the Word of God, but also as individuals, how we're to approach the Word of God. Now, that word exposition, even for those who are native English speakers, that's your first language. It's not a word you use very much. But we, we don't use it in really everyday conversation. But exposition carries this idea. The main idea of the passage is the main idea of what's being received, of what's being taught. So as a church, we aim in the pulpit when the word is preached, whatever passage is being pre preached, we want the main idea of the passage to be the main idea of the sermon. We want to say, God, we want to hear from you. You see, it's easy to approach God's word and make it say just about anything you want it to say. You can find a passage for nearly anything. It's not too difficult. Uh, let me give you an example. So husbands, Imagine if you quoted this passage to your wife, Job 27, 5. I will never admit that you are right till I die. Now that's the Bible. Husbands, how do you think it would go if you quoted that to your wife? Hey, I'll never admit that you're right till I die, Job 27, 5. It's not going to go real well, is it? Most of us are wise enough to know, hey, that's not the proper application and interpretation of that verse. You're pulling it out of context. And you see, if we're not careful with God's word, we can find passages that say all sorts of things, pull them out of context, and misapply them. So whenever we approach God's word, we're saying, God, we want to hear from you what you were saying in that context to us today. We want your word to speak. We want to hear from you, God. We don't want to hear from a man. So here, they gather to hear from God for exposition, to hear God's word taught. But notice how it starts in verse 13. It says, On the second day, the heads of the father's houses, of all the people, the priests and the Levites, notice who it calls out in particular, the fathers. The fathers here. There's a special weight and obligation and joyful duty that fathers have in leading their family to trust the Lord, to turn to the Word of God. Now, in no way does this uh, lessen the importance of Mothers teaching the Word of God to their children and making sure they understand that? No. But what it's saying is men, so often, men will get busy at work. They'll get busy with life. They'll get busy with all sorts of things. And they won't be taking time to fulfill one of their primary duties as a father. To say, we are a people who worship the Lord. We're a people who follow God Almighty to make sure that works its way into the household. Now, I'll tell you something that I can easily do right now. It's very easy for me to make every father in this room feel like you have failed, feel like you haven't done enough. And, and sometimes those feelings, those convictions are from the Lord, and we need to heed the word of the Lord and say, God, there are areas where I'm out of line. But that's not the objective. We want to see the great joy as fathers of graciously, gently, humbly leading our family to know, to hear from the Lord. Ephesians, or 1 Deuteronomy 6, in the Old Testament, it says that fathers are to impress the word of God upon their family. That involves actively feeding the Word of God to their family. 
Ephesians chapter 4, I mean chapter 6, verse 4, says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Isn't that easy for fathers to do? Kids have misbehaved, they've done something wrong, the father comes in and says, cut that out, stop that. No, don't provoke them to anger. Instead, do this. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This is what something that Scripture calls fathers to do. And it's easy. An entire culture can roam from who God has called them to be when fathers fail to do these things. Now, again, every father in here, we can make the standard for this so high that you all feel like there's no way I can ever do all those things. There's no way I could ever meet all those obligations to my family. So let me just give you a few things that I believe every father can, could, and that the Lord calls us to do. Pray. Fathers, do you pray with your family? Do your children see you praying? Do, do they know that you pray? Do they know that when times are good, when times are bad, you turn to the Lord and you trust Him? Fathers, do you turn to the Word of God? Do you read the Word of God with your family? Do you explain the Word of God to your children? Do you teach them God's Word? You see, we're called to do all these things. Those are basic things. Those aren't too hard. You can come home and gather around the dinner table and say, hey, let's open and hear from the Lord. Let's pray together. Fathers, God calls us to these things. And I'll tell you, if you're like me, ever so often I have to look in the mirror and go, hey, I think the Lord is leading me to lead my family in a different way. I've sort of taken it easy. I'm not focusing them on the Word of God. I'm not focusing them on prayer, that we need to do those things. And here, as they call the nation, they call them back to the Word of God. Look at what it says in verse 14. Verse 15, 13 says they're going to study the words of the law. That's what fathers are to take them to, to study the words of the law in verse 14. And they found. Now, if you find something, what's that imply? Something was lost. You don't find something unless it was lost. So they had lost and forgotten some of the traditions that God had called them to. They had forgotten who God had called them to be. And now, chapters 8, 9, and 10 of Nehemiah all go together. It's one huge event. Chapters 8, they celebrate the holy days. But then in 9 and 10, they don't want to quit worshiping. So they keep on worshiping for several more days. They keep worship going. It's like a reformation, a revival that happens within the people of God. And in chapter 9, we see all that the people were taught. I'm just going to give you some of the things that in chapter 9, uh, where the word of God was taught to the people. In chapter 9, 6, we see they start with creation. God created the heavens and the earth. In 9, 7, and 8, we see that God called Abraham to be a nation and gave him the Abrahamic covenant. In uh, verse 9 of chapter 9, we see the exodus. They were in slavery, and they were led to freedom by trusting God. We see them wander to Sinai. We see them given the law at Sinai. We see in verse 17 that they go to this place called Kadesh Barnea. They send out spies to look at the Holy Land. Spies come back and say, we can't take it. And they disobey God, and they wander for 40 years. We see the wanderings. We see Joshua lead them into the Promised Land. We see the judges, that they have a hard time and they rebel against God. We see the kings and we see them carried into exile. And finally, we see the return. In chapter 9, they walk through the entirety of God's word up until that point. They are studying, observing, listening to the word of God. God, what do you have to say to us? And here's a summary of what they heard. They heard this. 
We are sinful. Now that doesn't feel real good. Nobody likes to be called a sinner. In fact, in some churches, um, I've noticed that they won't even talk about sin because it makes people uncomfortable. Well, when we talk about sin, it should make us uncomfortable. We shouldn't delight in sin. We should have a hatred for sin. We also see this. God judges sin. That's terrible news. None of us like to be judged, but God will judge sin. But the third thing we see, we see this over and over again in Scripture, we see this as they walk through it. God is merciful. God is gracious. In the midst of our sin, in the midst of our rebellion, we deserve judgment, but God has made a way for us to be made right with Him. If you remember nothing else, each week, each day we can wake up and go, God, you have forgiven me through Christ. For the uh, Christian, for the person who's recognized this, I'm a sinner, I can't save myself, my sin deserves punishment, Jesus took my punishment in my place. And if I trust him, I receive his righteousness. It's not your righteousness. Church, we receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's one of the beautiful things we gather each week to be reminded of that. And each day, we need to be reminded of that day by day by day. The, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ saves us, and yet it gives us power for living. That's the power we live by. So here, they remind themselves of that, and in verse 15, they go proclaim it all over, and they're told to gather and make booths. So they're going to celebrate this holiday that they seem to have not celebrated in this way in a long time. This is probably the largest gathering of the people of Israel since they entered the Promised Land. Some say there are maybe 40,000 people, some say 100,000 people. This is a huge gathering of people to worship God. So let me ask you, how do you approach God's Word? What's the exposition you listen to? What's your primary voice? Is it the Word of God and you're saying, God, I want to hear from you in your Word, speak to me? Because every one of us, you'll have hundreds of different voices speak to you this week. They're going to they're gonna say uh, things like, Listen to the world. Where's your value? Where's your worth? Where's your identity? Is your identity in fitting in here? We're going to be tempted to listen to the gossip of our day, the news of our day. The world has a plan for your life. And that plan is to destroy you, to lead you away from God. The world doesn't want you following God. And it's always going to seek to pull you away. So what is the voice you're listening to? What's the exposition? Are you coming and saying, God, I want to hear from you. Today, God, I want to hear a lot of different voices. But I want your voice to reign over all. Next thing we see is application. Look at verse 16. So they're told to go make these booths. And in verse 16, so the people went out and brought them and made booths. This is, for, this is like an experiential holiday. The families, they would make booths. They'd be in them for seven days. And, and it's like the children get to camp out. I can imagine the kids going, Hey, Dad, can I help you build the booth? Hey, why are we doing this again? Why aren't we sleeping inside? Why are we sleeping outside in this booth? And they would retell them the story of the Exodus. Retell them how God led them out of slavery in Egypt by trusting the blood of the Lamb. They would recount this picture of the gospel there in the Old Testament. That someone else has made a way for you. That God makes a way. So they obey the word of God. You know, God calls us to obey his word. 
But the mistake we make in obeying God's word, we often think if we obey God's word, he'll save us. God doesn't save you because you obey his word. In fact, obeying God's word is not what saves you unless it's Christ. Obviously, the word of God points us to Christ. He saves us. But just obeying the be honest, don't steal, don't have sex before marriage, and in marriage be faithful. Obeying those things that God has given us for our good. That's why he gives them to us, for our good. For his glory, for your good. God calls us to obey him because there's no better way to live life. He made you, he knows you. The world says to follow God is slavery. That's the lie. You're either living enslaved to sin or you're living in freedom in Christ that God has called you to free from sin by the power of Jesus Christ. We're living one of those two ways. And we apply God's word to our lives when we hear it. So when you approach God's word, what are you saying to me, God? I want to hear from you, and then I want to apply it. What do you have for me? Look at what they do with these booths. Three places they put them. They put them in their homes, on the roof and in the courtyard. Then they put them in the house of God, and then they put them in the public square. Think about that. How is God's word applying to you in those three places? In the home. Oh, I think the home is often the most difficult place for people to live out their faith. You see, you get around people that don't know you. You come to church. Of course, you're going to say, hey, praise the Lord. It's good to be here. But you get home. And that's where people really see you. That's where people really get to know you. And here, they put the booths in their home, a testimony. God rules over our homes. Then they put them in the house of God. I said this last week, the enemy, he doesn't want you to gather with God's people. He wants you to believe this lie. You can live the Christian life apart from the church and the body of Christ. That's a lie. You can't live it how God has called you to. Two things. You need the church, and the church needs you. When you come here, there's other people who need you, and you need other people. And no church is perfect, but we gather, and the church, how does your faith lived out here? And thirdly, in the public square, everybody's going to leave here today, and you're going to go to your homes, to your neighborhoods, to your places of work. How is your faith lived out in the public square? They put the booths in all three of these. And they're going to assemble to worship God. Now, in chapter 10, chapter 10, we see that God records all the names of the people who signed and said, I'm going to obey the word of God. Nehemiah takes the people, him and Ezra, and say, we want to know who's going to obey the Lord, and they sign their name, and it's recorded in Scripture. Because you see, we're not to be just hearers of the word, but we're to be doers. Look at this well-known passage in James, in the New Testament. James 1, 22 through 25. But be doers of the word, not hearers only deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word of God and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer, but forgets, who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in what he does. Now hear this. It says a man who comes and looks at himself in a mirror. Now in the Greek, there's a few words for man. One word refers to mankind, meaning all of humanity, men and women. But then there is a word that refers in specific, specifically to a man, a male. And that's the word used here. Now men, y'all are looking pretty good today. How much time did you spend in front of the mirror this morning? Did y'all spend a long time? Some of you look and you go, hey, there's no hair up here anymore. I guess I'm good to go. 
You know, how much time are we spending in front of the mirror? I venture to say if any man spent 30 seconds in front of the mirror, that was probably pretty long, right? Now, husbands, how much time does your wife spend in front of the mirror? Now, she may not spend, some of your wives are probably pretty quick in the mirror, but I guarantee you, nearly every wife spends more time in front of the mirror than the man does, right? Men, we just look and go, okay, teeth are still there, I can smile, I'm good to go. Hey, bud. <laughs> Didn't mean to scare him. Um, but men, we approach the Word of God, I mean, we approach the mirror like that. Women, when you approach the Word of God, here's what you do. You look at the mirror, and you study yourself in the mirror. And not only do you look at the mirror and study yourself in the mirror, Mike, you might want to grab him, and we make adjustments. Women make adjustments. <laughs> He's excited to be at church today. Hey, again, I told you at the beginning, we welcome children. We're glad children are here. They can be children. Is Mike going to catch you? All right. Now, we welcome children. We're glad they're here. Makes us remember, hey, we were all once children, and God brings us up in his word. So, again, so women, how do, we, how do you approach the word? How do you approach the mirror? You look at yourself in it, and you study yourself, and you make those adjustments to, the word, to how you look in the mirror. So, <laughs> Margaret, you want to grab him? <laughs> I'll get Margaret to give it a try. <laughs> so, you make... <laughs> All right. Taffy, thank you. Well, we'll <laughs> just excited to be in church, thrilled to be here. We're thrilled to have him. Just a reminder, it's good. Um, so again... My point. Women, you'll look at the mirror and you'll study. What's the mirror tell you? I need to change my hair. I, I need to make an adjustment to my makeup. I need to make some adjustment. And you adjust your reality to the reality of what the mirror shows you. Scripture is to be a mirror to all of us. When we look at God's word, we're to see this is how God has called you to live. And as you look at it, you're to make an adjustment to God's word. Hey, I wasn't completely honest in that situation. I, I need to make an adjustment. Hey, I, I, I haven't been in the word of God much and hearing from him. I need to make an adjustment. The mirror causes us to adjust. But we're to approach scripture not like the man. Looks at himself in the mirror and goes away. Can't ever remember what he looks like. We're to approach it like the woman who comes and looks, makes adjustments, gets ready, spends time in front of the mirror. We're to be not only hearers of the word, but doers. And again, some people get this out of order. We don't do the word of God to be saved. We're saved by Jesus Christ alone. And our response is to joyfully obey the word because there's no better way to live. To live in true freedom, we obey God's word. He made us, he designed us, and we want to live how we're made and designed to live. So that's why we obey God's word. So let me ask you, do you apply the word of God to your life? What does that look like? When you hear God's word, when you leave here today, are you saying, God, what do you have for me? So first thing we see, we say, exposition. God, what are you speaking? Next thing, we want to hear from, we want to apply that to our life. Final thing in verse 17. At the end of 17, it says there was very great rejoicing. We celebrate. We celebrate when we hear the word of God. God hasn't left you clueless about how to live. He's told us, this is how I've made you. This is how you're to live. This is how you have great joy. You see, the word of God if you feel like obeying God's word is drudgery, oppressive, then you're approaching God's word wrong. 
the Christian, we go, I want to live for God's glory. And as we live for his glory, as we align our life up with obedience to the word of God, there's a great joy in that. There's a great joy in living obedient to God's word. Now look, God's people here, they're under oppression by the Persian nation. Nothing has changed. They're still in a very difficult season. They built a wall, they've read God's word, but nothing has really changed. There still has a major problem. But they have great joy in the midst of it. You see, God doesn't replace our sorrow and our suffering with joy. God doesn't give you joy in spite of sorrow, in spite of suffering. No, God gives us joy in the midst of sorrow. The world can't understand that. God gives us joy in the midst of suffering. He's with us. He's present. He gives us what the world can never give. I open with that example of St. Augustine. He went and tasted and tried everything this world has to offer. Left him empty. Many of you, some of you have done that. And you know it's true. This world can never bring you the joy your soul longs for. It can give you a temporary, artificial joy that only lasts for a moment, but at the end, it leaves you empty and in worse shape. No, the Lord gives us a joy that lasts and sustains. And we return to his word over and over again. God, I want to hear you speak. God, I want to apply it. And then there's great joy in going, God, thank you for speaking. Thank you for giving me direction. Thank you for being with me in the midst of the pain, suffering, and difficulty of this world. So let me ask you, do you rejoice when you hear God's word? Do you rejoice to apply God's word, to apply it to your life? You see, God's called us to be a people of great joy, not because of our circumstances, but because of who he is and the reality that he has redeemed those who trust in Christ. I pray that's you. Well, today we're going to close with a song called Better is One Day in Your Courts. And these people gathered. They gathered to worship God here in the book of Nehemiah. And here's the reality. Better is one day in the presence of God than thousands of days out here living for the world, living in this world's systems, trying to find our joy and our happiness and contentment in the world that will never be able to deliver it. Better is one day in his courts. Let's pray and then we'll respond in song. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is true. Lord, we pray that as a people, both as a church and as individuals, we would seek to turn to your word and say, God, we want to hear you. Lord, I pray that we'd be faithful to apply your word to our life, that we would seek to obey your word, not because it's drudgery or we're seeking to earn something from you, but because it is joyful to live in obedience to you. And Lord, may we taste the great joy of knowing that we are children of God, secured in Jesus Christ. And Lord, if there's those here today, and I believe there are, who have never placed faith and trust in Christ, may you today reveal to them your truth May they place their faith in you, and may they rejoice that they have been redeemed. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.